Hello, health psych students. This is part one of the exercise and physical activity lecture. And we will start by doing a couple of textbook definitions. So first one, physical activity, let's define it. That would be any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that result in energy expenditure. And we usually um, measure the energy expenditure and how many kilocalories it takes to, to do that movement. Normally when I was teaching in a classroom, I would give the example because I'd be walking back and forth in the front of the classroom going, hey, I'm getting physical activity here, but would any of you say that I am exercising right now? And usually people would say, no, you're not exercising right now. And then I would say, I know because I would be sweating profusely because that's what happens to me when I exercise. Let's define exercise. It is gonna be more deliberate here, planned, structured, and repetitive movement usually done for a purpose to improve or maintain one or more components of physical fitness. Okay, so there's exercise. Cardio, these are the types of fitness now. So cardiorespiratory endurance, your generation calls it cardio, my generation called it aerobic. Um, and I don't know if it was because uh, doing aerobics, aerobic classes and people with their bright spandex um, outfits on, if that kind of ruined it for the generation, I don't know. Um, but you call it cardio, I call it aerobic. Cardiorespiratory, you see in that word, the cardio meaning the heart and the respiratory, the lungs and oxygen. This is the ability to move oxygen, bring it into the lungs, to the heart, into the bloodstream, pump it out into the cells, and then drop off that oxygen for energy to make ATP in the cells for whatever function that the cells have. Um, and then collecting carbon monoxide and bringing it back through the veins, up into the lungs and exhaling it into the air. And we measure cardiorespiratory endurance in terms of VO2 max. Um, that usually involves a participant on a treadmill and ha having their air analyzed as well as blood pressure, stuff like that, or um, on, a, on a stationary bike. Muscular endurance is how long can a muscle contract over and over again or repeat. Um, so an example would be how, mu you know, how many times can your quadriceps repeat if you are running a marathon? Um, risk, if you have to do those, ever have to do those essays, like in those blue test booklets and you have to write real fast, which we don't do a whole lot of, we do a lot more typing and other things with our hands nowadays. And you get, you get that hand cramp. That's just because that's not a, a muscle of like handwriting that most of us do nowadays. Okay. Muscle strength is, um, the power of a muscle to move mass. Um, and this would be evidenced by like, uh, power lifting types of, um, activities. I don't know if you've ever watched one of those strong man, strong woman shows where they, they've got a tractor trailer linked to a rope and the person's got the rope in their mouth and they're backing up, pulling the tractor, tractor trailer type of thing, or toss throwing cows at the Highland games, those kinds of crazy things. Okay. And muscle strength is certainly going to be a bit different than muscle toning. Body composition is the measure of the body broken into muscle, water, bone, and body fat. Um, and some of you, particularly those of you in exercise science, have probably seen the DEXA scan over um, in the health college, or you have um, helped uh, do a DEXA scan on somebody. What the DEXA scan is going to do, so you see a picture right here of, um, say, a larger individual um, compared to a smaller individual who has um, different levels of, uh, looks like skeletal mass, as well as different levels of um, fat mass. Um, this, this individual on the right appears to have stronger skeletal structuring, probably meaning this person is exercising on a regular basis and less body fat. Um, and this individual over here on the left looks uh, certainly more sedentary. But body composition gets broken down into how much body fat we have, how much body water we have, how much skeletal muscle, um, how much total muscle mass, um, how much subcutaneous fat, which is the fat underneath the skin. Women have a lot more subcutaneous fat than men have, which is why women tend to look softer and men tend to look more muscular. Visceral fat would be fat that is inside the abdomen and visceral fat is the most dangerous of the body fats because um, it's, think about kind of like a beer gut type thing. Visceral fat is pressing on the organs inside the, um, the abdominal cavity and the thorax and that can be very dangerous for our organ functioning. Um, okay, so that's 
body composition and how the DEXA scan does that. Flexibility is ability to move muscles and bone structure around a joint. And flexibility is certainly going to protect us against injury. Like if you are, I don't know, you're a soccer player and you have to move your legs in a certain way in a soccer game, if you have practiced that flexibility and in performance you um, get, get jerked in a way and there's that kind of accidental bodily movement, it's less likely to harm the joint if there's already adequate flexibility around that joint. And then certainly for a lot of activities like yoga, she's very, very bendy. If I did that, I'd break. Um, uh, things like gymnastics, things like ballet. Um, there are a lot of different um, activities or sports where flexibility is it. It is absolutely it. It's interesting. I watched a, a master class with um, by Simone Biles, the, the gymnast who just flies and flips, and she's just amazing. And it was interesting how she reflected on the fact that throughout her gymnast career, she was always the little kid that was out there just wanting to flip around, and she wasn't very disciplined, and she really had to work on learning discipline in her, her, um, her different events in gymnastics. But I found it interesting that she, she acknowledged that she feels like as a gymnast, her body is not very flexible relative to a lot of other gymnasts and that she has had to um, train that certainly and try to keep as flexible as possible. But then her, her way of doing gymnastics is like power moves. It's just more power because she says she's, she's good at that, but she's just not as flexible. And so she doesn't really emphasize um, more of the flexible movements, which I thought was pretty interesting because she seems absolutely amazing to me. So the idea that somebody that is that amazing can feels like they have strengths and weaknesses was like, wow, yeah, hey, she's human. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so in the United States, if we take a look at who is more active, and keep in mind, this is all before uh, coronavirus. So activity levels for a lot of individuals, um, like I hear amongst my, my friends, we are actually more physically active during quarantine because it's safe to get outside. Um, and as long as you're social distancing or like me and my, my girlfriends, even when we bike now, we wear masks just because the wind tunnel research has shown how much in heavy breathing, which is happening when you're you're riding a bike around here, um, how much moisture and droplets um, can be shared with people around you, particularly if they are behind you on the bike. So I'm hearing a lot of people say they're more physically active, but then I'm also hearing um, of uh, like my sons have been, the gym in their apartments have been closed um, and they're doing the best that they can inside with, with what they've got. So, but a lot of people in quarantine, think about it, New York City or the big, the big cities where there's population density, people have been a lot less active um, during quarantine. We know that people who are more educated um, get more exercise than people with less um, education. Those with an exercise history, particularly if their exercise history was enjoyable, had lots of reinforcement involved in it, which is very different from say a child who was not very coordinated, a child who had a very large body, a child who didn't get picked until um, the very end of the picking of the captains of the teams in school. People who've had any kind of punishing exercise history are likely to not be exercisers, to be sedentary. And so again, our entire history of reinforcement and punishment can help determine these things. Um, white individuals in the United States are more physically active than blacks and Hispanic um, individuals. People with more money, I've got a picture of a dude golfing here. My parents are big golfers. Um, people with more money are, um, are more likely to be able to afford gym membership, being able to afford golfing. I've heard it's expensive. Um, being able to afford equipment in their home, to be able to work out in their home, being able to take vacations and go to places where there's a lot of physical activity. Younger individuals tend to be more physically active than older individuals, although there is a huge advantage for older individuals to be exercising. One of my colleagues in graduate school, Dr. Abby King, she was ahead of me in graduate school, has devoted her scientific and her clinical career um, to getting older individuals like people in nursing homes um, exercising. Males tend to be more um, physically active than females, but there's a generational thing that has happened that has changed slightly. So you younger folks, if we go into a, assuming the gym's open, we go into a gym on campus, um, the gals are usually doing the cardio 
and the guys are usually doing the weights. Now, some of those flip, some gals do weights and resistance and some guys do cardio, but the majority um, of who's working out and doing what falls down on gender lines, but that's generational. Um, women nowadays are a lot more physically active than say older women, like your grandparents' generation, my parents' generation, that type of thing. When I was in, I've got to tell you a story. When I was in uh, working in weight management down at the medical university of South Carolina, I, I did a six month rotation in weight management. I remember um, running one of the groups and we had a lot of Southern bells in my class. So we had a lot of well to do, um, women from Charleston with, you know, the delightful Charleston accent and that type of thing. And we had an exercise physiologist come into our weekly group and was talking about all the benefits of exercise and whatnot. I still remember one of the women in the audience who was just like dressed to the nines. She, she raised her hand. She said, but if I did that, I would perspire. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just thinking, like, like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we sweat and, uh, you know, we've got showers for that nowadays. There are a lot of us that are quite physically active and, you know, we work out and then we shower and go on with our lives. Um, anyways, it was funny. Um, we know that white collar people, um, which are people who are professionals or people who are more likely to be sitting a lot um, on computers or interacting in their work, are a lot more likely to be physically active. Blue collar workers or pink collar, so blue collar would be like plumbers, mechanics, that type of thing. Pink collar would be more things like um, uh, servers or waitresses in restaurants, that type of thing. Those individuals are less physically active in their free time. And a lot of times there's a bit of a mentality of like, I'm on my feet all day. And if I'm on my feet all day, when I come home, I deserve to relax, kick my feet up, have a beer, that type of thing. And then the final thing that I want to talk about in terms of who's more active are people who are lean and healthy. And this is going to come back around to us, and I want you to ponder this, when we cover the obesity lecture, because it is easier for lean, healthy people to be physically active, and that keeps them physically active, and that keeps them lean and healthy. People with larger bodies and bodies that are not very healthy or not very fit, it is it hurts. It is painful to move those bodies um, or they're not very coordinated. And so it's easy to make mistakes if they're playing sports or, or fall down if they're playing sports. Um, that is likely to be very punishing for them. And it's no wonder that it is the largest kids or the kids that are the least coordinated are the ones that drop out of sports early. The kids that are um, are healthy and lean and coordinated, and there's even some really cool research in freak, with the Freakonomics guys that shows that in kids' sports, the kids that were the oldest ones on their team, depending on where their birthday falls during the year, were likely to be the kids that were most successful in that sport, therefore the kids that were likely to keep going in that sport, therefore the kids that were likely to be great in high school, get college scholarships, play, play in college, versus the kids that were the youngest ones based on where their birthday fell during the year on each sports team as a child, were less likely to do well in the sport, more likely to drop out and not continue. So even um, like where your birthday falls during the year has, for a lot of people kind of predicts their athletic history. Okay. So I know you exercise science know about ACSM. This is going to be new to you psych majors and, and probably some other students in this class, but the American College of Sports Medicine, ACSM, they um, study what is most successful in terms of exercise and getting us fit and healthy. And so they have laid out um, guidelines. In my mind, they are um, very lofty guidelines and we'll talk about what that means psychologically, behaviorally for a lot of people. But they have developed their fit um, and fit divides into frequency. And they say that we should be doing a minimum of five times a week of either moderate intensity exercise or three times a week of really vigorous exercise at an intensity level of 60 to 80% of our VO2 max. And the way you can calculate your VO2 max is you take um, 220 minus your age, 120 minus. Oh, I need my exercise science folks. I think it's 220, I'll, I'll figure it out. 220 minus your age, and then take whatever that number is and multiply it by 0.6 and 0.8. And ideally your heart rate, your target heart rate when you're exercising vigorously falls between 60 and 80% of your VO2 max. The Tuxin test is more of a psychological behavioral metric. Um, and I've used Tuxin with, with uh, clients before because they kind of get it. That 
if you're exercising, let's say you're exercising with a buddy, you should be going intensely enough that you can have labored conversation with your friend, but you would not be able to sing and hold a note. I am not going to sing for you. That would destroy each of you and you would quit my class right now. But if you could sing and hold a note, um, then you're not breathing in heavy enough. Um, and then I don't know if you all have ever had the situation where I've had this kind of situation on a bike where I've, I've been going so hard, but I'm really thirsty and I really want to take my water, but I have to be very careful about it so that I don't choke because I'm breathing so fast that I've got to make sure I've got a moment to actually swallow. The type of activity that ACSM recommends is large muscle and keep in mind the largest muscles in our body are in our legs. Ideally, we're exercising all the muscles in our body um, on a regular basis, but the best type of cardio um, is things like walking, running, hiking, rowing, biking, stuff that's using those big, big leg muscles on a regular basis. Ideally, the activity is rhythmic and repetitious. Um, like all the stuff I just talked about. And then the timing, uh, 30 to 60 minutes a week. Now, um, if I had you in class, I would kind of survey you and ask you how many of you are getting all of this on a weekly basis. And when you start thinking about it that way, even for college students who tend to be young and healthy, and then you start to extrapolate that to the real world, you, we, that's where we realize that to go back so few individuals are actually meeting the ACSM guidelines. So ACSM has added to that. So if that's not enough to keep us fit, then here's the other stuff that we ideally are doing. We're doing resistance or weight training, um, and they're suggesting three times a week for every major muscle group. I do find it fascinating, the gender difference, like when gals work out, like I've got a bow flex and I've got a yoga mat and I do this combination of like weight training and, um, different yoga moves, stretches and yoga planks and that kind of stuff that when gals work out and do their resistance training, they tend to do whole body all at once. I find it funny with guys, both my partner, both my sons, it was a big to do. It was like, it was legs day. It was legs day, mom. I did legs or it was, it was arms day, mom. I did my arms. And it was just like, Please, what, what do y'all do? What are you guys doing? Um, you got your protein drinks and you got your body parts and whatever uh, guys. Okay. Um, then they say we're supposed to be doing two to four sets, eight to 12 repetitions per set and that we're resting 48 hours in between that is because the weight training is breaking down muscle and it's actually the recovery time where the body rebuilds and rebuilds more muscle after appropriate training for the flexibility ideally we're doing this two to three times a week um, certainly yoga and Pilates would be um, a good example of training flexibility and then they're saying this is how many seconds we should hold the poses how many repetitions we're supposed to be doing and then making sure we're doing this on warm muscles not cold muscles because if you stretch hard a cold muscle you are going to tear it so you want it to be nice and warmed up the neuromotor activity that's not enough um, the neuromotor activity um, is more functional fitness training so balance agility coordination thinking about yoga and moving from one yoga pose to another and being able to control it there's a yoga teacher at um, ASU and she has what she calls the um, the trembling of truth or the truth of the tremble and when you're in a pose and you're trembling you've obviously not trained that particular muscle group in that pose but isn't it interesting that after you you gain that stability um, and that balance and whatever that pose is then you can oftentimes push the skill set even further um, and and train and not have the tremble of truth or Tai Chi. I don't do Tai Chi, but it's beautiful to watch. Um, but lots and lots of neuromotor balance in that. Okay, some ACSM add-ons, if as all of that is not enough. Um, we still have to consider the weekly amount. And now they're um, also advocating, that I've tried to change my lifestyle a bit with this, limiting the amount of sedentary behavior because I like to get my exercise, but then I also will find myself sitting for very long periods of time um, when I'm particularly when I'm writing or I'm working on lectures or that type of thing, there's been even more sitting during coronavirus. Um, I tried to figure out how I could teach standing up at a distance, but you wouldn't really be able to hear me and I don't want to wear a headset. 
Um, if you back in Smith Wright in the good old days pre COVID, um, a lot of uh, ASU faculty members um, have stand up desks. Um, some have that for back problems, some have it just because they want to be standing and not sitting so much. Um, not Jimmy Fallon, whom I think Jimmy, oh, it'll come to me. The other Jimmy Kimmel. Um, I remember seeing him interviewed at one point in time. He had lost a tremendous amount of weight and really improved his, his fitness and his blood pressure and all that kind of stuff simply because he got a treadmill desk and he would do most of his writing for his show along with his other writers um, during the daytime and then perform his show in the evening. And he just got a, a treadmill where he walks slowly on the treadmill and does his writing while he's walking and said he didn't do anything else in his life other than do the walking desk and lost a tremendous amount of weight from that. Um, ACSM also, I know a lot of people, I don't do a pedometer or no count steps and that kind of thing, but I know a lot of people that that has been very motivating for them and, um, they make sure they get their steps every day. Um, but ACSM says we shouldn't just rely on pedometers as a sole measure of amount of weekly exercise. Uh, I don't expect you all to know all this. I just want you to know that ACSM has guidelines for adults. Uh, they have guidelines for children and teens. And basically the, the amount and the guidelines for children and teens are very similar to the guidelines for adults. And if you think about, we've already talked about a little bit of this today. Um, if we think about children in athletics, like where are we going wrong? I don't know what has happened to your generation, but in my generation, um, PE in school was more about sports and competition than about individual fitness. And we used to pick teams. That was a, a thing. And I, this is where I feel like I, in my career, in my interest in eating disorders, body image, and obesity stigma, I think it started somewhere as a child. I was um, uh, pretty, pretty strong and coordinated and I would get picked pretty early in the team. So it wasn't like a personal affront to me, but I remember standing around in the picking process where you had the captains picking the students and there was a pattern like who got picked first, who got picked in the middle and then who got picked last. And it was the who got picked last part. I just remember feeling like, pain for you know emotional pain for those people like that could not feel good to be rejected in that way and and picked last because you were the only person left um and my bet is that those individuals probably were the individuals that were punished um in athletics and then the individuals that didn't want to continue on in their life and doing exercise because it was psychologically scarring for a lot of individuals um, I also could tell my boys, they, they were, well, boy, what well, we used to play, I used, I learned this game when they were little because they were both really hyperactive. So you, they, you had to give them a lot of activity that I used to play this game called treadmill. They were so competitive with each other. Um, and they were less than two years apart. So they were kind of like in the same, you know, physical shape at the same time or capability. I, when they were little, I used to play the treadmill game and it would be like, okay, put one of them on the treadmill. It's like, okay, let's see if you can run 15 minutes at whatever four miles an hour. And then one would run 15 minutes. And then I was like, you got to beat your brother. Let's see if you can run, you know, 17 minutes um, at four miles an hour. And they would just, they would go back and forth and compete with one another. And I would just sit back as a mom and go, yes, yes, I have worn them out. Um, and then they would be delightful children. Um, but I remember when we started in Pee Wee everything with them. So they did Pee Wee all the way up to, and they played high school sports and they're very athletic, um, just personal athletics um, nowadays. Um, but it was interesting watching from Pee Wee to the lower grades to the, you know, the middle school grades and up into high school, the kids that weren't good, that who good meaning successful in the athletics and the competition, the scores, the good defenders, all of that kind of stuff would drop out. Um, and so it was interesting watching that those who were um, better at the competition were more likely to stick with the sport um, over time and those who were not were less likely. And so it was that kind of thing. And that's what I grew up with the competitive sports. And I think, actually, I think it's really good in terms of self-esteem for gals to play sports as well as for guys to play sports, but especially for girls. Um, but there wasn't much of an emphasis on personal fitness. And I kind of wish, and I don't know if that's changed very much um, nowadays, um, it's like some PE teachers are probably much better at that, at helping 
kids learn personal fitness that they can keep doing um, later on in life. Um, so there's a vicious cycle that happens for a lot of individuals um, where some individuals aren't very good. It just is punishing. It's exponentially punishing. Their body doesn't get fit. And so their body can't, can't, um, it doesn't have the same capability versus the kids that are really good with that stuff. And then, so that kind of begs the question, the number one public health intervention that we do in the United States to try to promote fitness is physical education requirements in the public schools. Um, so that kind of begs that question, are kids getting enough? Are they getting the ACSM guidelines and physical fitness in the school system? And my answer is probably no. There was a exercise science professor. Um, he's since left ASU. Um, take a sip of water here. But he would go into the school systems and instead of looking at kids' athletic performance, what he would do is wire them with heart rate monitors and he would follow them and track them over time. And as school got started in the fall semester and kids were in PE every day and he would take a look at their fitness gains. And I remember speaking with him at one point in time and he would say, if you went into and you watched their performance, like let's say the kids are running, they're running around the track and you see, you know, this one kid's really fast. He's like, you know, zip, zip, zipping around or she's zipping around you would think that that kid is working the hardest. But what you would, if you back, if you look at the heart rate data, let's say there's a kid out there that's not as physically fit and they're huffing and puffing and they're just barely jogging. They're not even really running. That's the kid with the highest heart rate. And he would just kind of point out that when we focus on performance, um, like I remember doing the presidential physical fitness thing and you'd get a medal if you passed all the, the, the different, um, uh, athletic tasks um, when I was in school. Um, it's not the kids that are performing the best that are working the hardest and getting the biggest benefit. It's actually like the kid that's huffing and puffing and jogging. It would be the kid with the highest heart rate who's getting the big, biggest fitness gains. And so I thought, what a great way to individualize it um, in the school system. Begs the role of parents. Uh, if a child has two um, a parental figures in the home and they're both athletic, that kid's going to be a lot more athletic. One parent who is athletic, that kid's going to be a little less, but athletic. If you've got sedentary parents, that are a lot more likely to have the kid that does not um, engage in exercise if parents don't model it. Um, and then it also begs the role of athletics and uh, fitness opportunities in the workplace. Um, at ASU, the faculty members have a tremendous amount of flexibility in our schedules. We work crazy hours and we work long hours, um, but we've got a lot of flexibility. And so there are a lot of faculty members. Um, there are gals in my department that do yoga um, three times a week uh, and they leave in the middle of the day and go do their yoga. There's a pickup basketball um, game that happens that a lot of the, the guy staff and, and professors um, play in that pickup basketball competition. I've heard it's very competitive. They're always getting injured. I'm always hearing Sean's knee and now Tim's, you know, hip and whatever. Um, in that pickup basketball. Cause I think they, they're pretty masculine. They're, they go really hard. Um, so we've got the flexibility, but if you think even employees at ASU, the housekeeping staff, um, the, um, the food services people, the physical plant people, they are not allowed to leave when they are on the clock and go work out. So it's where we see that SES, um, divide. Um, I do know that offices, um, that do allow their employees to on the clock, go and work out in a company gym, have better productivity from their workers. Um, my friend from college, David, works for Google up in New York City. And when I took my family up to New York City, um, David took us on a tour of Google and it was amazing. They had multiple restaurants that made very healthful food. They had multiple gyms um, where you could do anything. You could swim, you could do weights, you could do cardio, you could do Pilates or yoga. They had multiple gyms. And restaurants, they even had massage chairs and masseuses on site. And I remember, you know, telling David, like, this would be my dream place to work. I would love this. And, oh, and the food, the cafeterias, and everything, it was free, free to the employees. They didn't have, they even have to pay. So they had plenty of healthy food available, plenty of gyms where they could, could work out. And I remember asking my friend David, I'm like, 
do people slack in their work here? You know, like, could I go in and have a healthy breakfast, go work out, go get a massage? I don't know, do a few emails, something like that. And what was interesting, and this is brilliant for Google, he's like, no, he said, the longer we keep people here, and he said, there are people that come in on their days off to work out or to eat, and then they go into the office and they do a little work. He said, it actually encourages the employees they're more creative. They can concentrate better because they're eating healthy and they're working out on the job site. He says, but it keeps people here for more time and they get more productivity out of their employees because of all of that. And it was one of those like, oh my gosh, um, brilliant. And wouldn't that be great to have a work environment like that? Problems with the ACSM. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, how lofty the goals are, um, and you got the add-ons and everything nowadays. Um, it, you know, it makes it look, the ACSM guidelines to me make it look like if you're, not a, if you're not a personal trainer in the gym helping people and doing all that stuff yourself, like how on earth are people meeting these goals? And it's only 8% of men, 7% of women in the United States, which kind of begs the, the question, I'm not questioning ACSM guidelines. I trust that if you do all that stuff, you're going to be maximizing your health and your fitness, but are the goals too high for many people? And from a psychological standpoint, sort of knowing that if you're trying to help an adult start to exercise as a psychologist, you've got to realize probably all of the punishment that has occurred in their lives in their history. Um, what we also know, and this is good for you, you exercise science is good for you psych people. The biggest shift in fitness goes from sedentary, um, lifestyle couch potato to getting some leisurely exercise, like say walking the dog for half an hour every evening. Um, and then if you keep bumping it up, you keep getting higher and higher fitness levels, but you get diminishing returns in terms of the amount of benefit physiologically from the exercise. So from a psychological standpoint, I, I know we need to shape exercise in people. Start with a reasonable goal that is a very low level goal that is also, sometimes you want a medical doctor or an exercise physiologist testing people that are risky, like somebody who's had a heart attack would be an example of cardiac rehab to write an exercise prescription that you know is gonna be safe for them. And then you want to shape those goals where they can accomplish that, gain fitness, bump up the goal a bit, and realize that things that they didn't think that their body could do, that if you shape it, you start slowly and you keep building up and up and up, um, that is very reinforcing for individuals. Um, I have found just as an example, it's been, it's been weirdly reinforcing being in quarantine. I've been able to move up my weights on my Bowflex um, weights, stretchy things. Um, I have been able to, to be able to accomplish some yoga things that I never thought I could because I've just got more time on my hands. Um, so I've got more time to kind of push and train some of that stuff. Um, we need to recognize individual differences in body types. And if I had you in the classroom, I would ask you this question right now so you can kind of answer in your own head. But I would say, how many of you out there love running? Raise your hand. And I would be one of those people. I was like, oh, yes, as a little kid, I ran around all over the place. I've been running all my life. Um, gotten slower, certainly with age, but I'm one of those, oh, yeah, me, pick me. Um, and then I would ask, how many of you out there absolutely hate running and there would be a bunch of hands of like people just like ah, i can't stand it so it's like one of those things like either people love it or they seem to hate it there are not very many people in the middle with the with the running you know kind of like oh take it or leave it um i've also found it really interesting like when i do um some of these uh bike races around here blood sweat and gears cowbell uh the brutal um i used to do bike for all of that stuff got canceled this year's really sad i'm missing out on that um how many big guys are cyclists? Because big guys who can't like, you know, hike fast or probably not very comfortable running in a body like that um, are very comfortable on bikes. And I find it fascinating when I'm out there on the road with them. First of all, if I can get behind them and drag behind them, they move a lot of air. So if I need to kind of uh, rest a bit and kind of drag a little bit behind them, I can get behind them and just sort of, they're kind of, they make a wind tunnel kind of pull you for a while. 
but I find it interesting when we're on a downhill, they come flying past me on the downhill. And then when we're on an uphill, just because I've smaller, smaller body than these big dudes, um, I'm always like, you know, passing them on the uphill, then they pass me on the downhill. And at some point you do that tit for tat enough, it's polite to introduce yourself. <laughs> and so a lot of times you kind of make friends when you're out there um, introducing yourself to some of these cyclists and then you all get back um, back to camp at the end and you eat and you drink and you, you socialize and talk about the ride. So we got to recognize those ind individual differences. Um, even again, Simone Biles, I was surprised that she was saying, I'm not very flexible for a gymnast. It's like, oh my gosh, you seem amazingly flexible. Um, and then just kind of acknowledging from a psychological behavioral standpoint that the sedentary people are the people with the most barriers. So instead of thinking in our mind, kind of shaming people like, oh man, you really should get some exercise or you're not fit because you're lazy, you're not exercising. We don't want to do that. We want to recognize with a lot of empathy that the sedentary people have the most barriers and then using a motivational interviewing type of communication style, we want to help people acknowledge their barriers and see if we can bring down their barriers. Okay, this is the Paffenberger uh, Harvard alumni study where they tracked Harvard alumni um, starting in middle age till later in life. And they had a bunch of uh, middle-aged men enrolled. And this was one of the first studies, like we, we look at this now and we're like, well, duh, we know this. We know this scientifically, but this is one of the first studies to determine this. They found that exercise decreased the risk of cardiovascular disease, as well as all causes of mortality. So even things like cancer, diabetes. Um, and what they found, and I, this put this in your head, this is a good little stat to remember. For every one minute of exercise, these men added two minutes to their lifetime. Okay, so every one minute of exercise, two minutes to a lifetime. And that, that doesn't mean you can go and run ultra marathons and live to be a thousand years old, um, but pretty amazing return on investment. Okay, put that, keep that, remember that. For every one minute of exercise, you add two minutes to life. And let's add to that, it doesn't say it here on the slide, people who exercise on a regular basis and are physically fit have better quality quality of life. So it's not just the add on the minutes, that type of thing, the length of life, it's better quality of life. Um, and I know we could have this philosophical discussion, you know, do you want to live to be 110 if for the last 20 years of your life, you're in a diaper, in a nursing home bed, you've gone blind, you can't hear, you can't communicate with other people. I think most of us would go, no, thank you. I would not like that. Um, and so we know, again, having physical fitness and quality of life, even in the older years, makes for a better life. Um, and so if we had to come up with one fountain of youth behavior, it would be exercise. Now, remember, we've talked about this semester, certainly with a, a, a pandemic going on, we've got all these behaviors to protect ourselves and to protect others um, from infecting back and forth people. Um, but then if we had that magic wand and we could change one health behavior after all of that protecting infection, it would be the cigarette smoking. Number two would be getting people in the United States exercising. And number three would be changing eating habits. But exercise really is a fountain of youth. Um, they also found in the, in the Paffenberger study that vigorous exercise was the most protective and that's kind of what acsm has said right that's what acsm has studied this and that's why they make these very lofty recommendations that the most intensive um, exercise program you're going to get the most benefit so when it comes to disease and mortality um, uh, we know there's less cardiovascular disease less lung disease um, there's even research to show that people who've exercised inten intensely that seems to be protective against uh, coronavirus and the lung damage, and that individuals who uh, even got infected, who had uh, been exercising, that really deep, intense uh, breathing seems to have helped individuals heal more effectively from coronavirus than individuals who did not have that fitness and that lung capacity. Lower levels of diabetes, lower levels of a lot of cancer. A lot of the cancer lowering has to do with nice, healthy immune system. People who exercise on a regular basis have a much healthier immune system than people who do not. And then some of that has to do with horn, hormonal mediators between um, healthy body weight, physical fitness, um, 
lowering risk of cancer. It's the same attributable risk um, as obesity and problematic health, hypercholesterol um, and problematic health, hypertension. But there's a very high population burden to sedentary behavior because, again, over 90% of people in the United States are not physically fit. They are not exercising on a regular basis. And so a tremendous population burden from that. I am going to play this for you and then I'm going to close out part one. Um, and let me make sure that you can watch this. This is a tomato. Think it's good for you? Think again. It's one simple trick to keep controlling your weight. Our dear thoracic surgeon Stephen Gundry says he solved the weight loss. I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and welcome to this visual lecture I'm calling 23 and a half hours. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important, and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I... I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What is the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Postmenopausal woman who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41% reduction in the risk of hip fracture. It reduced anxiety by 48% in a big meta-analysis. Patients suffering from depression, 30% were relieved uh, with low dose and that bumped to 47% as we uh, increased the dose. Um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue. And of course, the kind of outcome of choice or my favorite outcome is quality of life, which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better. And this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours, and so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but, uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping. And what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Stephen Blair, uh, he's a professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, and he looked at this in what's called the aerobic center longitudinal study, which followed over 50,000 men and women over time. And uh, along the less left side of this graph is something called attributable fractions, which is uh, a kind of fancy word, but it's the estimate of the number of deaths in a population that would have been avoided if that specific risk factor had been erased. So for example, turning a smoker into a non-smoker or a couch potato into a daily walker. And along the bottom is the typical risk factors. You can see the uh, hypertension is incredibly important and so on and so forth. But the one that was most, that kind of applied the most risk was this sort of mysterious CRF, which is cardiorespiratory fitness, which is really low fitness. So low fitness was the strongest predictor of death. And, and this is important that most of the trials we see, to be honest, are funded by uh, pharma or, or um, other companies because they've got a drug for hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. And we rarely see see fitness thrown into the mix. And so it's nice to see a, a trial that's not so 
siloed. I, I, Blair's work is interesting. He also did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, obesity. What he found was, you know, sort of two things. One is obesity and no exercise. That's a very bad combination. And that's where we saw many of the negative consequences of obesity from a health point of view. But if the, if the obese person was active, even if they didn't have the weight loss, but were just active and obese, that was much, much better. And that the, that the exercise ameliorated much of the negative consequences of uh, obesity. Um, so if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? So when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more, if you're a kid, an hour a day, if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that, um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush. Uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something. And after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, women who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down. So it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise. So it can be broken into three higher intensity, it looks like it's, it's equivalent to less time with lower intensity. Uh, but I think uh, the, obviously the clinical pearl is mostly thinking about your, your style and habits and your personal cues. So if you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, I'm just going to walk you through some quick uh, slices of the literature. Uh, the first one comes from Japan. In, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Japan required all employers to conduct annual health screens for uh, their employees. And so a large gas company in Japan called Osaka uh, used this to answer a great question. Um, so if people walk to work was longer, did that reduce their chance of serious health problems? So in this example, high blood pressure. And what they found is under 10 minute walk, no difference. 11 to 20 minute walk, 12% reduction in rates of high blood pressure or hypertension. And over 21 minute walk, a 29% decrease in rates of high blood pressure. So uh, the authors calculated that for every increase of 10 minutes in your walk to work, there was a 12% reduction in the likelihood of getting high blood pressure. The second exhibit is uh, looking at stents. So this is something we commonly do down medicine. So you can see on the left here, the arteries blocked. On the right, a vascular surgeon's gone in and uh, put in a balloon, opened it up, and left a stent to keep it open, which makes great sense. So a German researcher named Reiner Hambrecht uh, looked at this with about 100 cardiac patients. He got half the group to exercise, and by that I mean 20 minutes a day on exercise bicycle, and then once weekly, 60-minute aerobics class. And the other half got the high-tech stent and just their sort of normal activity. And after one year, 88% of the exercises were event-free compared to 70% of the people that got a stent. Um, so both worked, uh, but I find it, you know, sort of incredible that the, uh, the low-tech uh, made a bigger difference. And you have to remember that the stent just fixes one part of the heart. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, I, I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, well, I guess, two quotes. So one is Jerry Garcia, the, the, the singer who is the lead singer for the Grateful Dead. And he said, somebody has to do something. It's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And I, I think that's true, that it, in some ways it has to be us. As Hippocrates said, uh, walking is man's best medicine. And so I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So something to think about. Thank you very much.
Okay, everybody, I'm going to um, stop the sharing. Um, uh, you can rewatch that if you want to watch the Mike Evans on YouTube. You can find it and either rewind this and watch it again if you would like, um, because there's a lot of lot a lot of information packed into that. Or you can just uh, search it on YouTube and watch it again. So I'm gonna say goodbye for now. This is the end of part one of the exercise and physical activity lecture.